Nicole, we're seeing lots of interest in uh, OER and open policies around the world, um, but it can be confusing um, because uh, open policy means different things to different people. Is there some way to kind of understand what we mean when we're talking about policy in this area? Yeah, so policies at their core are uh, frameworks for guiding decision making and action. At institutions, they define you know, how governance operates, how resources are allocated, uh, and what kind of decisions are made and activities are permissible. And OER policy is really about the kinds of policies that can enable the creation and use and improvement of open educational resources to solve problems. Uh, are these policies uniform across different settings or are there different types of policies for different types or levels of organizations? Different types of policies can help enable open educational resources. I think one of the most uh, basic types of policies focus on removing barriers or creating pathways for the use and creation of OER. Uh, one example of that is looking at the copyright policies at institutions to make sure that when faculty create open educational resources that they know how they can share it freely and openly. And there are also policies that focus on allocating resources, whether that's funding to support a program or allocating the time of staff and technical support. And then finally, there are policies that provide a broad support and endorsement for the idea of OER. And this is the kind of policy that we've actually seen very effective at the federal level. The United States recently included uh, open education and support for the idea of open education in our recent Open Government National Action Plan. And this was the first time we ever saw the Obama administration or any level of federal government uh, actually provide a strong statement saying that the government supports OER. And that simple act has actually opened a lot of doors for advocacy at the federal level and there are conversations going on uh, across different agencies about adopting open policies and the Department of Education actually has announced uh, that it's created a new position focused on expanding OER in K-12. And these kind of policies can also be effective at the institutional level by providing cover and making it clear to faculty and staff that open educational resources are supported by the institution and uh, can be uh, assigned and created. Uh, because this happens at so many different levels, the ones you've just described, uh, it can be confusing for people. Um, well, what is a, uh, are, are open policies uh, difficult or complicated or confusing or, or can they be very simple? Um, uh, what, 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 what do you mean when you talk about, for example, a specific open policy uh, for a government or for an, an institution? Are those? Well, policies call, come in all different shapes and sizes, uh, just like the other kinds of policies institutions have. They can be board policies, they can be departmental policies, they can be state bills and laws. And uh, it really can depend. And I think uh, there are very simple policy changes that can be made that help advance open education. For example, a requirement that any grant-funded projects uh, carry an open license, especially when uh, funding comes uh, from the public. One of the really exciting aspects of the policies that you've been successfully promoting here in the United States and around the world are the opportunities it then creates for uh, collaborations between groups and across borders and even across cultures uh, that didn't exist before because once the OER policies are aligned between different organizations and they agree what constitutes a legal use of learning materials, uh, then groups can learn together uh, and work together and even co-create knowledge together in ways that simply aren't possible if the, uh, uh, if the different parties to those collaborations had to pay somebody a toll uh, each time they wanted to interact with each other. So for me, that's really one of the, the really most exciting uh, things about uh, these policies. It's not what, only what it does internally for the organization that implements the policy, but the way it then creates opportunities for that organization to work with everyone else around the world who has a similar policy. But, but maybe policy is not always the right tool, uh, mm -hmm. depending on s different circumstances. When uh, and how do you know uh, it's time for a, a policy discussion to take place? 
So building off of your point there, I think uh, one of the things that's really, really important about policy is that different uh, institutions have similar needs and are doing similar things around educational materials. So as you say, policy uh, isn't always the right solution. I think that it's always important to think about what are the benefits of having a policy? And policy can be very effective because it provides a framework for making decisions, not the decisions or programs themselves. And it often can outlast specific initiatives. And uh, that can ensure that open educational resources and practices are really institutionalized and sustained into the future. But it's also important to consider that it's not necessary to pass a policy to be effective in advancing open educational resources right now. There's so many things that institutions can do today uh, to help advance the creation and adoption of these resources. And I think it's important to consider whether a policy is necessary immediately or if it makes sense to simply launch a program and build support and awareness for the idea of OER and then build policy out of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned the, um, that it can be a difficult struggle to put a new policy in place, um, but even uh, after the policy is in place, there are challenges around implementation. Mm -hmm. What are the steps or, or what's the experience in um, the implementation of policies once they've been enacted? It's critical to remember that changing policy isn't the equivalent of changing culture. And as you're working toward establishing a policy, it's just as important to begin planning for how that policy is going to be implemented. And I think the really key point there is to think about who are the stakeholders, who are the people that are going to be affected by this policy, who, are, who is going to be responsible for actually carrying it out in their day-to-day -day lives. And make sure that those people are engaged in the policy-making process. And in institutions of higher education, that includes students and bookstores and administrators, and I think the really key group is faculty, because at the end of the day, faculty members are the ones who are assigning OER in their courses and creating it. So uh, making sure that, that faculty members are involved in vetting and uh, helping to draft and create a policy is, is really critically important. And uh, it also, it, uh, I've also discovered that it makes sense in making that culture change, the experience that we've had, um, is rather than uh, force uh, faculty members or teachers to make uh, what might be unwelcome changes, often the best culture changes begin by finding the faculty members or teachers who are most interested in the new policy, and then the early adopters, you might call them, and then supporting them to become successful. Uh, and then letting the other instructors observe uh, what the successful implementation of the policy means as a way to sort of reduce their anxiety and, and help them come along in a way where they, where they volunteer to change rather than uh, resist what they see as an unwelcome change. And I think, as you say, it's, it's so important to find champions and help support those champions. And we already know that there are so many faculty members who understand the limitations of traditional materials and the impact that high textbook costs are having on their students and want to make a change. And in many cases, just providing the support to faculty members to make that change, whether it's through policy or whether it's through program support or resources, uh, can really be effective in, in moving things forward. So we've seen how policy can uh, make a difference at the institutional level or at the state level uh, or at the government level. Um, and you make such a clear case for it, um, but why is this important now? If this is so, uh, let me put it another way. Uh, if this is so important now, why wasn't it important when you were going to school or when I was going to school? Why has this I issue of open and OER, the need for OER policies, suddenly uh, uh, surfaced as such an important issue uh, in, in this time uh, and not 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago? I think the advent of the internet has just changed everything, and we see that in the world around us. It's transformed industries from film to music to news, and it's changed the way that we interact in our, our everyday lives and the way that we're able to share information. And it's created this unprecedented capacity to actually improve teaching and learning and make publishing more efficient uh, and expand access to educational opportunities. And 
having those opportunities now uh, is why we're talking about open, because the policies that are in place in today's world were created before the internet in, a, in a, what I think was a completely different world. And policies haven't really been updated to reflect the capacities that we have now. And that's why open policy is so important because it removes barriers that exist in policy today and enables us to use the full capacity of the internet. One way that I think about it, uh, I'm often asked uh, with regard to open education resources, well, what's the business model that will support open education resources? And that always struck me as just, uh, uh, for years I tried to answer the question and then I realized it was the wrong question. It's kind of like asking somebody, what's the business model for IV drip systems? You know, the drip systems they put in your arm when you go to a hospital? Because after all, the first few hospitals didn't have IV drip systems. So you could make a case that since they didn't, if somebody wanted one, they need to have some kind of a business model that's outside of the normal medical care system in order to have an IV drip system because they weren't part of the way medical care was delivered originally. It strikes me that the same thing is true of open education resources. They didn't exist before, but they should be integrated into the institutions that serve education. We already have a business model for, to support open education resources. They're called schools, and we have quite a, quite a lot of them. But what's needed to make sure that those schools take advantage of open educational resources are updated policies exactly of the kind that you've been developing and promoting around the world. Does that make sense to you? Yes, I think it does, and I think it can be even broader than that. I, I think the way that we handle information in today's world, whether it's digital data or research publications or any information, especially research or information that has been publicly funded, we have uh, an opportunity to, as institutions of higher education that are generating these resources, to make sure that they are available to the public, not only to expand access to knowledge, but also to provide a platform for innovation. And finally, what uh, policy uh, progress are you uh, most excited about working on in the next couple of years? Where will you be uh, focusing your efforts? I'm most excited about the opportunities for international collaboration around open educational resources. Uh, we've already seen through the Open Government Partnership that many countries are already moving in this direction, and I think if we can get national governments on board with the idea of open educational resources, it can advance this idea and allow us to collaborate across the world. And toward that end, uh, some people missed it, but it was last year that President Obama went to the United Nations at the UN General Assembly and for the first time uh, inserted a commitment to work with other countries on developing collaborative opportunities to use open educational resources through this uh, relatively young uh, international organization called the Open Government Partnership, which you've been very active in. Right now, just a handful of countries have agreed to join the United States in exploring a way to develop this collaboration. Um, uh, but once we have more countries uh, participating, what do you think are some of the activities that the open education resources collaborating countries might engage in that would benefit their citizens? Well, going back to the example I gave earlier, I think top level support for the idea of open educational resources is really the first step. And beyond that, I think the most common sense type of policy is to make sure that when publicly funded uh, educational materials are created that they're released as open educational resources.